So it's a long title, I will not repeat it a second time, but uh, go to, to the introduction right away. And uh, I will also not read um, this slide, but just uh, give you uh, an impression of what happens when I'm on my desk, or Christophe is on his desk, and the phone rings, and we pick up the phone, and somebody says, you say I've been drinking and I haven't. And then we try to uh, use our most confident voice, and we say, yes, you have. And then they start, ah, but maybe a couple of weeks ago, I was on a party, and the gin tonic will not have been alcohol-free. And in this way, we, we always try to, uh, we are a little bit anxious that this most confident voice is confident, but maybe not a uh, hundred percent uh, uh, underpinned with, with real science. So that's why we questioned uh, the 20 nanogram per milliliter that we use, is that really a number we can be confident in? And it's, we should be, because it's very important, uh, because we say when it's lower than 20 nanogram per, per milliliter, you, it's compatible with abstinence or minor alcohol intake in the past couple of weeks, when it's higher, we will say it's a social drink. And for us, it's a hard number. 19 is below, 21 is above. And we know that this conclusion might have life-changing impact. It can be a father who isn't allowed to see his children anymore, can be a truck driver who cannot drive his truck anymore, and so forth. So, thinking about the 20 nanogram per milliliter, I was wondering where does it come from? And I ask the students, dig into literature. I give you plenty of time and dig into literature. So what she did was she searched in uh, PubMed all articles referring to PET or phosphatidyl ethanol. And then uh, she select, so she found 60, 632 articles. And then she selected those articles which she had uh, access to via our library account at the University of uh, Ghent, and she withheld 82 articles, which also referred to a cutoff or a decision limit. And then she listed all of them. And what we could see was that 30 of these 82 references used 20 nanogram per milliliter as a cutoff. 12 of them, 35 nanogram per milliliter, 35 uh, references uses 8 nanogram per milliliter as a cutoff, and 8 another value ranging between 2 and 10. And so she digged a little bit further because we couldn't really find why 20. And so we start to dig further. And uh, so the 20 is mentioned for the first time in 2009. And uh, a couple of these um, references refer to their methods, a limit of quantitation or limit of detection. One gave no real explanation. But the others, in total, uh, uh, well, the others use a reference. They just say, ah, this article used 20. I will also use 20. And then if you dig a little bit further, you can see that actually uh, uh, 14 of these uh, articles end by the USTDL. Uh, guideline and uh, the others again refer to the limit of uh, quantitation or detection. For the 35 nanogram per milliliter, it's quite easy. One is from the Swedish harmonization, and the others, 11 articles, just refer to the Swedish harmonization. So that's easy to trace back. And then the 8 nanogram per milliliter and the other values are basically people who use their limit of quantitation or limit of detection as also a decision limit. Now, if you read this, link, this publication of 2018, we, uh, and it's a correct thing to do, we use a number which will allow us not to falsely uh, accuse someone of having been drinking. And so the 20 nanogram per milliliter is high enough, but still it's an arbitrary threshold. So we thought, can, is there a way to underpin this arbitrary limit with real patient data? So we use um, our in-house procedure, which is here a summarizing slide, but I will give a presentation this afternoon on the details of the method, so I will now uh, just uh, tell you that we use volumetric dry blood samples, 
uh, a very similar extraction procedure and we use LCMS for quantification. Using this method, we have set up um, a large scale population uh, study, uh, which was actually the aim was to uh, get insight into the variability of kinetics of disappearance of pets. And what you should know about this study is it's large scale. We, got, we selected or we had over 800 candidates selected in five days, just random people who engaged to stay sober for four weeks. And uh, why do we, or were, why were they so engaged to do so? We actually hook up to an initiative which is called Tournée Minérale in Belgium, but you have many other examples all over the uh, world, like Sober for October or um, uh, Dry January. So you encourage people to stay sober for one month and just experience how healthy it is not to drink. And so we thought, if you stay sober anyway for yourself, Please here our sampling kits take three uh, samples, one in the beginning, one after 14 days, and one after uh, at the end after about 28 days. So they did, and we collected all of these samples and we measured all of them. So 2,400 uh, samples. None of all, not, not all of them were perfect, not all of them um, drank enough before the study, so we had to exclude some people. Uh, but anyway, based on this collection of data, we were able to fit a linear mixed effect model uh, using the normalized PET scores. So if you wonder why there's only one dot in the beginning, each person's starting point was normalized to the starting point. So all people start with one. So there's 600 data points beneath that one dot in the beginning. Um, and then, so these normalized PET scores were used as response variable and the time as a fixed independent uh, variable. Uh, and then uh, we accounted for random effects. Um, oh, the random effects accounted for the within and between individual variability. So and as you will see, this graph only contains uh, data points with a PET concentration 16081 above 4 nanograms per milliliter. So it definitely, as Professor Weinman said, takes more than four weeks to have a non-detectable PET. So uh, we developed this model with the intention to compare any new person we follow up against this model. And then we have a decision tree which looks like this. Uh, I will not go into much detail because again, I will also talk about it in this afternoon. But basically what we do is we check the second and the third point. As you can see here, the third point, um, which is over the green line. And so if the third point does not fall below this blue area, we say, I'm sorry, but you have been drinking. Um, but then we thought maybe we can use this uh, model also for other purposes and actually try to predict values with this model. So the red lines of the model are actually uh, represent the prediction interval which means that 95% 95, 95 of all new data should fall within these lines. So, and if you recall how we set up the study, this lower and upper limit accounts for within individual variation, because we have three, two periods over which we can say something, <coughs> each person took three samples. It includes between individual variation, because we have over 600 persons in this study, and moreover, it includes all measurement variables because it includes 2,400 sampling points measured over a couple of months with different calibrators, different sample prep, uh, different issues, day-to-day uh, -day variability and the instrumentation and so on. So this is also what you include when you calculate measurement uncertainty. So the model also includes measurement uncertainty. So we have asked to uh, uh, make an uh, actually a ready to use application uh, for this uh, model. Uh, everybody can find it on the link which is on the slides. And so you can very easily put in data and actually look what it looks like. So we tried to uh, predict pet values after a defined period of time for a certain starting point. And if you can see, um, so you have the green, uh, the green lines which are the 95% prediction intervals. 
you have the blue area in which theta point should fall. And then uh, here in red is the line for the individual, and blue is the ideal curve based on the average decline of pet values. So someone who starts at day one with 120 nanograms per milliliter PET, 16 or 81, will end up after 27 days with a PET value of 10 nanograms per milliliter. This person, or the other way around, you can also calculate what the uh, corresponding upper limit of the prediction interval would be for that person, starting at 120 nanograms per milliliter. And then you can see that that value is 20 nanogram per milliliter. So this means that for people starting with PET values of 120 nanogram per milliliter at day one, after four weeks, 95% of people should end up below 20 nanogram per milliliter. So what we did then was we defined certain switching points. Uh, you can uh, see the list on the slides. And we compared people with, pet, or we compared values of people with uh, PET above and below the switching point to the decision limit of 20 nanograms per milliliter. So, for example, for this person with, or for the switching point 120, someone with a PET value below 120 on day one, having a PET value below 20 nanograms per milliliter on day on the third sampling day, we would score it as expected or correct. Someone with a PET value above 120 nanogram per milliliter on day one and above 20 on day three, we would score it as incorrect. Uh, I use the term true negative false positive because I would like to do sensitivity specificity calculations and then these terms actually uh, ring a bell, but they are not really the, the <coughs> just wording wise the correct terminology. So we did this calculations for uh, these 10 sampling or uh, switching points uh, and so uh, PET values for the uh, 461 subjects that we tested ranged from initial PET values from 4 to over 1000 nanogram per milliliter. And so here is uh, actually the summary of the true positive, false negative or the correct and incorrect uh, values and then using the 20 nanogram per milliliter as a decision limit we can actually see that the probability of a negative test result in a, in a person that should be negative, so those which start below 120 and that should end up below 20 nanogram, the probability of um, finding this result is 99%. Uh, Even for people who start at 160 nanogram per milliliter, it's still 99% of people will end up below 20 nanogram per milliliter after four weeks of being absent. So the probability of not having drink uh, in an individual with a negative result, uh, which is the negative predictive value, is over 78%. So to conclude, I think it's fair, or we think that the decision limit of 20 nanogram per milliliter to score abstinence or minor alcohol intake includes all possible sources of variation, uh, also the measurement uncertainty, and the accompanying high specificity demonstrates that this cutoff can be used with high confidence to score compat compatibility with abstinence or minor alcohol intake. We never exclude minor alcohol intake. So, uh, before you ask questions to me, I also would like to ask one question to you. I can choose to do it now and in the afternoon, I'll do it now. We have developed this model. We are very keen to test it with very independent data sets. So whoever thinks has data of people being abstinent for a certain period of time, maximum four weeks, with more than two PET measurements, you may send them to me, I put them in the model, and I would like to validate with very independent data whether this model uh, is as strong as we believe it is. So now you can stop. Thank you.